I have to prepare a second beer before we talk about Psycho 3. Sure. I can understand that. I love Psycho 3. I'm judging. We, we have not discussed this beforehand, by mm -hmm. the way. You had never seen any of the sequels, right? No, not one. Psycho, oh. obviously, it's a classic. It's a yep. great movie. Uh, Psycho 2, surprisingly solid sequel. Uh, did very well uh, at the box office, so Universal was like, let's keep going. <laughs> um, uh, pretty shortly after, they rushed out Psycho 3. Yeah, and it picks um, up, what, like the next week? Yeah, it's and it has a, it's a really strong continuity. A lot of the actors come back. Yep, um, yeah, like the sheriff. And the sheriff. The oh, we didn't even mention the sheriff. I love him, by the way. Yeah, he's great. What's her problem? I don't know. But if Norman Bates is crazy, there are a whole lot of people around here running him a close second. He's so, like, he's not, like, the hard edge. He's just, like, this affable, you know, yeah. local sheriff in this small town. He really just wants the, the town to be nice for the people. It's <laughs> <laughs> really just it. This is a part of the second movie. He has a scene with Robert Loggia in his office. And it just holds on him, like, eating a sandwich for a moment. Just enjoying a sandwich. Yeah. I wouldn't mind filling in until you found somebody permanent. I just won't be staying around too long. No one ever does. One of Anthony Perkins' stipulations for coming back is he wanted to get into directing. Mm -hmm. So he directed Psycho 3, uh, which I love the visual style of this movie. It's a big part of why I like the movie. Yeah. As we said, Psycho 1 and 2, great double feature. Psycho 3, I like, one, just because I love Norman Bates as a character and the hotel and all that stuff, yeah. but it's just so goofy. Don't laugh at me, mother. Don't laugh at me. It is a weird little movie. It's a weird little movie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it, it wants to, it definitely wants to take the, the story to a different place. Like, we're, we're kind of primed, like, particularly as I was watching the sequels pretty close to each other. Like, I'm primed, like, we're ready for Norman to be psycho again. He's cracked. He's got yeah. mother back. He's ready to do some stabbing. Yeah. But instead, we kick off with something that's more reminiscent of Vertigo. Yes. Well, that's uh, you can tell that uh, uh, Anthony Perkins is interested in kind of paying homage to not just Hitchcock's work on Psycho, but Hitchcock in general. Yeah. Because uh, before, and that, this is when I knew the movie when I first saw it was going to be something kind of different, is before we even see anything, we just have a black screen. There is no God! And we hear a character just yell, there is no God. <laughs> yeah, which I actually recognized... I was like, oh, I've heard that before. And I was thinking it must be like some industrial band sampled it in the 90s or something. Negative Land. Oh, really? Negative Land uses that on a ton of stuff. Oh, interesting. Yeah. There is no God! What was your first idea of God? Anything that's religiously related that pops up. Like, <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> so, well, yeah, and then the scene starts. We're right in the middle of some sort of action. And yeah. it's, not only is it someone yelling there is no God, but it's a nun. And she's climbing up this bell tower, and yeah, it's Much very scuffling. reminiscent of, of Vertigo. Yeah, and, uh, and then a nun falls into the middle of the bell tower, and oh shit. Wasn't your own sin great enough? You'll burn in hell, but that's your burning hell! Yeah, well, this is, uh, uh, Maureen is her name. Yeah. And she runs up to the bell tower. She's gonna, you know, she's having a crisis of faith. She's gonna kill herself. All the other nuns are kind of giving her a hard time, and she accidentally kills one of the nuns. Like, oh, good. And this is the opening scene of Psycho 3. <laughs> so I love that. Yeah, I, I, I do. I appreciate that it really just throws you in. Mm -hmm. It's like, here, you're in the deep end. Yeah. Figure out what the fuck's going on. <laughs> well, it also ties back in, like I was saying about the first movie, how it's like it starts with that hotel, and it's like you could go into any room and you would have a completely different story. Yeah. Uh, and so this movie feels as unnecessary as it is as a Psycho sequel. It does have that kind of anthology feel of like, oh, here's another person that ends up at the hotel. Yeah, and it could have gone that way too, like a Halloween thing, where it's just like the central thing is is the motel. Yeah, and you're bringing in different characters, and Norman could be there or not there. Well, that was the conceit of the the failed uh, TV pilot. Okay, the Bates Motel TV show with Bud Court. He oh. <laughs> Bud Court was the lead. He takes over the hotel, and I guess that was the idea, is that each week it would be a different story about someone that's at the hotel. I, I've never seen it. That's the only thing Psycho-related I've never seen. Okay. Give me that! Don't you get smart or I'll brain you with it. 
I mean, it's yeah, the, fr the framework's there. It's so iconic that you can absolutely use it for something like that. Yeah. It makes more sense than Friday the 13th, the series. That's true. <laughs> Which I don't think I've ever seen a single episode of, but it's like an antique store or something. It something has like nothing that. to do with anything yeah. of the movies. <laughs> it's like, you can't even do a Freddy's Nightmares thing because Jason doesn't do anything. That's right. Yeah, he doesn't talk. Yeah. But as she runs away from her, her nun friends, she gets picked up <laughs> by, by... She gets picked up by Jeff Fahey. Oh... Wouldn't want to lose you. Who, it's a testament to Jeff Fahey that uh, his character is so likable because he's also such a scumbag. He's a total scumbag. <laughs> oh, man, you never get any feeling that he's like, he's going to turn out to be a good guy or anything. He's a fucking he, He's a dick bag. from the beginning. Oh, yeah. it's so good. But he's still likable because he's Jeff Fahey. Yeah. He's got a lot of charm. Like, I mean, well, he thrusts himself on her at night. They pull over in the rain. and Stupid bitch. You could have been coming instead of going. <laughs> that's where you, that's where you get a Jeff Fahey to fucking do lines like that. That's yeah. so fucking ridiculous, <laughs> but it's great. Then there, then uh, he makes his way. Jeff Fahey makes his way to the Bates Motel, where Norman hires him on the spot. Yeah. <laughs> My name's Norm. Norman Bates. Whoa. What you been painting? Oh, I I'm sorry. Uh, step into the back, the parlor, while I clean up. Send the spider to the fly. Mm hmm. And this is, uh, I love the introduction of Norman in this movie, where it's, you know, uh, he picks up some dead birds and then it cuts to him in the kitchen. Right. He's got the spoonful of, uh, what do you stuff birds with? Is it just sawdust? Takes the same spoon and scoops out some peanut butter and puts it on a cracker and eats it. <laughs> He this, doesn't give this, a fuck anymore. This movie's going for dark comedy more so than anything else. Oh and uh, Anthony Perkins actually, uh, one of his big reference points was uh, Blood Simple. Right. The Coen Brothers movie. <laughs> he, he screened that for the cast and crew before they started making the movie. And, and got Carter Burwell to do the, do the music. Oh, yeah. Which, uh, which is better than the... Um, uh, Jerry Goldsmith score for two. That's something to point out is that the, the score for Psycho is so iconic and the sequels, neither of them used it. It's interesting. No. They both went in completely different directions. Yeah. I like the music for the third one. It has that main theme that is used both uh, diegetically and non-diegetically. Right. Because it's the theme for the movie, but then later in the movie, we hear Norman playing it on his piano. And then when Jeff Fahey's at a bar later, we hear like this funky version of it playing <laughs> yeah. on the jukebox. Hi. Which got released as a single. Oh, at really? The time. Yeah. It's just the same thing over and over. I know, but they wanted <laughs> they wanted some kind of uh, some kind like uh, Universal and MCA MCA wanted some kind of promotional thing they could do. So there's like music, like pop music on the soundtrack that Carter Burwell did with um, Stanton Miranda, who is someone that is inter uh, related to early Sonic Youth, oh, like New York. Interesting. Like, it's a weird confluence of things happening on that soundtrack. Yeah, well, it's an interesting score. It's very very different. Yeah, I mean the Jerry Goldsmith score is very Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, um, but with these really crappy, like, synth intrusions, mm. like, they really bugged me. The, th the third movie, it's it's mostly synthy kind of sounding. Yeah, it? like, if you're going to go that way, go it's, that it's way. It's consistent it's with that, yeah. And I like it. I like the score for the third one. Very much. Um, but, yeah, Jeff Fahey, his character, really introduces just how sleazy the movie is going to be. Mm. And I think that's another reason I like it. It's just so sleazy, the whole film. Oh, my God. <laughs> but, like, it, it's, it's, too, it's too, yes, like... It's too comedic heights. Like two days after he's moved into the cabin at the end, he's got a fucking porno collage all <laughs> over the walls. He's got pornography all over the walls. And he's got fucking purple lights in his lamp so he can hold him by his dick. And well, that's 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 the scene where I knew that I loved the movie. <laughs> Whatever that music is, it's very like. I don't know, <laughs> softcore porny kind of. Yeah, there's like that sax. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's I think the scene is supposed to be sexy. Hey. 
but it's it's like yeah, he's got these two lamps. It's just just Jeff Ahe naked with these two lamps in front of his crotch, doing some sort of light show on this nude woman. It's so his weird. His pornography is all over the wall. Yeah. <laughs> just like oh man, that's gross. And that's the start of too. Another thing I like about the movie, I mentioned the visual style, uh, and and Anthony Perkins has clearly taken some cues from Hitchcock, but. I, I don't think I've ever seen him mention this, but I feel like another influence on the movie was like the kind of Italian Giallo films. Cause like yeah, the, the lighting in that scene and then specifically that same uh, character that has the one night stand with Jeff Fahey, once he kicks her out of the hotel room and she's completely naked and he throws her clothes to her. Yeah. Her, her death scene in the phone booth very. feels very Argento. Yeah. And then like the shots of her feet kind of dancing on the broken glass, like, and then the, a lot of the lighting too, like the purple lighting in that scene, yeah. the, uh, the back room at the parlor. There's a lot of, yeah, like a very colorful palettes. Yeah. And uh, so I don't, cartooning almost. I don't know if that's a, if Anthony Perkins had any influence from Italian stuff, but. Maybe, maybe just watch Creep Show. <laughs> maybe. I don't know. But I do wonder too, the, the parlor, there's like this bright green light whenever yeah. he's back there. But I wonder if that is potentially a reference to Vertigo again. Could because be. the hotel room, you know, there's the green light coming in from across the street there. Right. Yeah, there's, there's, could be a potential a lot of things and we don't it's, know. It's a weird collection of influences, but that's, that's kind of why I like it. It's a lot more stylish than the second movie. That's, that's very true. That's one of the things to like about stylish, it. Stylish, weird, and sleazy. But not very likable. Like, nobody's particularly likable. I mean, even the, the, the fucking reporter that's there to, like... I do like her. She's kind of got this, like, old, like, 1940s, fast-talking, sassy reporter thing. Kind of. It's just like, <laughs> uh. You know, you really shouldn't rely so much on that pretty face and those pearly whites, because come-ons like that could get them both punched out. Then you'd be left with only your charm. See, I like her. Uh, I think you're supposed to sympathize with Norman again. I don't, um, though. Not very well. You don't. And I, I don't know if this is just a case of Anthony Perkins being, uh, you know, distracted by also being the director of the movie, but every line is delivered with, like, the same inflection. Yeah. We, we've been closed for a while. Renovations. But there's more life along this road than there used to be. And, and good prices, good service. Things will pick up. Well, I can't have that sort of thing going on in my motel. Gives the place a bad name. Uh, uh, please, don't take that the wrong way, Marion. I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, Maureen. And uh, Maureen is, is not a very good actor. See, I liked her in the I movie. I really, she only had like two modes, mm. which was mumbling and hysterics. <laughs> For the most part. Like, she could, there was a little wiggle room between, like around each of those, but it was just like... Her motivations seemed off a lot and just like, I mean, obviously I know she's supposed to be playing a confused person that's going through a crisis of faith and all that, but yeah. it's just like, so why did you want to leave and then immediately go back? Father Bryant said I could come stay with him. Norman understands me. He understands forgiveness. I failed so many people, Father, I won't fail him. Norman Bates gets a girlfriend and it's as awkward as you would expect. Uh, but that, that kind of like, uh, twist to, you know, there's a lot of parallels to the first movie, which is her initials are MC. Right. Uh, she has the short blonde hair. Uh, she's staying in cabin number one. Yeah. So that you have the whole lead up to that, which is just like the first movie where Norman is, you know, looking through the people at her. Yeah, um, except, and they do that in two as well. Yeah. Except both times it's definitely updated for the 80s. So you like, you see... Right. The things that they couldn't necessarily show in 1960. You, you, you see a lot more of the body double. Yeah. It's so clearly a body double in <laughs> oh, both those movies. Oh, man. <laughs> so clear. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that, that whole lead up where it's just like the first movie and you're like, are we just going to make the first movie again? But then he goes in and I love that twist. <laughs> She has, this, she has this vision of the Virgin Mary. Right. She, she mistakes Norma. She mistakes Mother for the Virgin Mary <sighs> and the 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 knife for a, a crucifix. Cross, yeah. Like, I love that. And that's that's leads to the whole thing at the end where she goes back like I saw the Virgin Mary. Like, yeah. You, yeah. You we're out of blood. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, the delusions. I, I can appreciate it's supposed to be it's supposed to be delusions all the way through, and she's she doesn't know what she's doing. She thinks she she's found a good soul, but not 
Not so much, although he does seem to love her. Yeah, I do love their, their sort of courting, the scenes with them like out on a date. They're in like this, this like tacky old, like it's like an old person's supper club. Which of course, yeah, Fairfield's gotta have a few of those. Yeah, well it's, it's so great because it's like there's barely anyone else there mm. uh, and it's all old people. And it's like, well, Norman wouldn't know where to take her. Of course not. <laughs> this is probably a place that his mom went to in the 50s. Mm. <laughs> so that's what he knows. But then it, it, he's like teaching her how to dance. And it just cuts to the the guy playing piano, and he's just like, I love that. It just cuts to him for like a second. Yeah. <laughs> so weird, weird little touches like that. Yeah. Um, and then she pointlessly dies. Yeah, I, I will say that I like the movie, but the third act thing just kind of fizzle out. Oh, Jesus. Norman. <gasps> Can we say something about those fucking stairs and how, about how it takes until the fourth <laughs> movie for someone to actually properly fall down them? <laughs> what is it with those fucking stairs? <laughs> it, again, it works in the first movie because number one, he's already been cut yeah. and it's like a dream. Mm -hmm. In the third movie when it happens, it's just like, it looks bad. It's very it abrupt. Yeah. It's just like, we needed to do this. Right. It felt like the exorcism in Exorcist 3. It's just like, <laughs> just, we have to do this. You gotta just put it in there, yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, put all sorts of sharp little things poking up at the bottom of the stairs. So like, whoops. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's a, it's a bummer, generally speaking to me. Like, because it's, it's, I want it to be better than it was. Mm. You know, I wanted it to, it's, it's tough coming off of Psycho 2, because Psycho 2 is a generally good sequel. Yeah. And it was, you know, way better than it had any right to be. And this this feels like what Psycho could have, Psycho Two could have been. Uh, Psycho Three, from a definitely from a story perspective, it feels like a more kind of typical generic sequel. Yeah, it's all the weird choices that they make that make it interesting. There's to that, me, especially the visual style. Like yeah. I love the lead up to when he goes into Marine's room. Uh, and this is really the first time we've seen him like dressed up as mother since the first movie. Right. Um, and it happens pretty quick. It's just like, oh, he's. He's doing this again. Yeah. But there's like a shot of the knife and it's like turned in a way where it looks like you're looking under the crack of a door, but then he turns the you realize it's the the like the glimmer of the light on the the blade of the knife. Yeah, that's a fantastic shot. Like things like that. There's lots of cool stuff like that in the Yeah. Movie. Yeah, my, my issues really are the story and the acting. That's fair. I mean, uh, Anthony Perkins yeah. not great in the movie. <laughs> no, I mean that's like you, that's what I've been talking about this whole time is this the level of empathy for all these characters and Yeah. Three doesn't really provide us with a lot of people to care about. Mm. You know, I care a little about Jeff Fahey because he's a fucking nut. <laughs> <laughs> you did a nice job on her, Norman. Fresh as the day she was croaked. He's just like, his plan is to uh, extort Norman? <laughs> and get money from this rundown hotel off the highway? <laughs> he's, he's, he doesn't know what he's doing. He's he does scumbag. not know what he's doing. Get money wherever he can. Yeah, I, I, I loved his death. Watch the guitar. And he's lost his mind in that scene. I don't know if he's drunk or what, but or if it's just bad direction. But he's well, like sweaty and like the, the, that purple lighting is still going on. He's, I feel like it's a panic thing because he's found out like he's gotten Mrs. Spools down from the house into his room. Yeah. So like I feel like he's he's panicking and like he's kind of pushed into a corner almost, mm -hmm. and he feels like that's the way he's going to get out of it is to threaten Norman, which. Right. Bad idea, son. Yeah. I love in that scene, too, there's like a, a Woody Woodpecker cartoon playing on TV. <laughs> but someone gets killed on the toilet. Uh, That's a fun Friday the 13th kill. He's the kill. only one who's not drunk. It is sort of weird, like the, the first woman gets killed in the phone booth, and I like that scene, like I mentioned, it reminds me of like an Italian movie. Yeah. Uh, never mentioned again, doesn't really have any purpose other than Just re we're making a slasher movie now. And that Norman is killing people. Yeah, and then he kills the woman in the, in the bathroom uh, who they put in the, uh, the ice chest. Yeah. Don't tell me my job, Ms. Venable. Well, somebody has to. You're not gonna let him go. That, that's where it's like, that's clearly the Coen Brothers influence. That, that sort of like <laughs> macabre humor. Yeah. 
but yeah, like, it, she's really, like, the motivations, you know, even the, Norman doesn't need a ton of motivation. Is it just that she's a woman and she's around? Yeah, oh, who he kills. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. Like, I get why he kills the girl in the phone booth, because she's a whore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but this one... That's on the on the toilet in the parlor. She's just around. She's not. Yeah. She's not rabble rousing like everybody else in the hotel. That's <laughs> go, reliving this football game or something. I don't know what the fuck. Dude. They're there for homecoming. Yeah, but they're all old. Yeah, I don't know what's going uh, on there. <laughs> but she's like the only one. She's just like, I just need somewhere to piss. Oh, I'm dead. Like that's yeah. not fair. Properly. No, well that's that's when we say this feels more like a conventional sequel where it's like, well, now he has to kill someone because that's what you do. In because we need a killing at this point in the in, yeah. in the movie. Yeah. Ugh. I like him uh, disposing of the body afterwards, though. There's that great, really low angle shot when he throws her out the window. Yes. And her face falls like right into the camera. <laughs> and there's the green light from the parlor. Yeah, again, uh, the visuals. Yeah, yeah. Those hold up. It's worth a watch for sure. It has my favorite line in any of the movies I guess I did leave the bathroom a mess. I've seen it worse. It's a, it's a weird little movie that I enjoy, even though I know it's not a good psycho sequel. Yeah. Um, worth it, watching for Jeff Fahey. You can. I, was comfortably ignoring kind of the rest of the <laughs> denouement at the end. Like, I mean, it's important that Norman is able to to free himself of mother again. Yeah. You know, fine, whatever. But the whole thing, like, where he's got Maureen set up on the on the couch with the candles and the reporter comes in, it's just like, meh. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, it doesn't, feel, it doesn't feel like the movie was building to anything. No. Uh, which is a problem. And then um, you've got that whole reset of the reporter charging in and explaining, like, it wasn't, Miss, she's not your mom, it was, she's crazy. Yeah. Like, she was crazy, Norman, but she wasn't your mother. Mrs. Small was your aunt, Norman. Killed your father in a jealous rage and kidnapped you when you were just a baby. Resetting the whole end of the last movie, just like, <laughs> it feels really forced. Just like, who cares? None of that matters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she could have been his mom the whole time. None, that doesn't change anything that happens to Norman. Right, yeah. You know? He still has a weird mommy issue. Yeah, that yeah. he fixes again and he frees himself again. Right. I do like that last bit in the car when he's... Well, first of all, the, the, the sheriff comes back at the end and he's like, you're not getting out ever now. Look what you did to yourself. Bye, Norman, bye. God, son, you'll never get out again. He's so disappointed in Norman he really because is. everybody was rooting for him. Like, oh man! <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. then, yeah, Norman's in the car and he's just got the severed hand in his pocket and he's petting the head. Yeah, okay. It's very goofy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, but that's another one too, where like everything goes dark and it feels like a like a, a stylized kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right, because like the background goes dark and then the rest of the car goes dark and it's just his face for a minute. And the story goes that uh, with Psycho 4, which was a made-for Showtime movie, yeah. um, Anthony Perkins wanted to direct that as well. Someone didn't want him to direct. Whoever was in charge didn't want him to direct Whoever'd it. Whoever had seen Psycho 3. Well, from a visual standpoint, Psycho 3 is yeah, great. Maybe he maybe wanted some performances. <laughs> Um, but they didn't want him to direct. They hired Mick Garris to direct it. The character actor of directors, Mick Garris. Mick Garris, who seems like a very lovely man. He is. He, he has a podcast. He's responsible for keeping a lot of these horror filmmakers kind of in communication with each other. Yeah. And, but he is also possibly the most boring filmmaker ever. Every movie he does is just so bland. Now, here's the thing. Critters 2 is his, is his best movie, and that's a problem. Well, I'll agree with that. <laughs> Critters 2 is definitely his best movie, but I honestly, I like the direction of this, of Psycho 4. It's there, there fine. There are some really fun shots, some really nice shots. Mm. I'm thinking of shots like when Norman and his mother are out in the picnic, and he's talking about her hair as mm. one of the positive memories, and they do the shot from, from, from his perspective of Olivia Hussey, like with the hair trailing down. Like, that's a neat shot. That's a cool little touch, and that's yeah. something that doesn't feel like it was in the script necessarily. Okay, so you could shoot fair. that any, any number of ways. Yeah. Or the way that he layers current Norman into the flashbacks. Oh yeah, there's a couple bits with that. That's when really he shows up at the funeral. But I, I feel like nobody has seen Psycho 4, so we should probably set it up a little bit, which is it's basically, it's like half sequel, half prequel. Right. I think it's ignoring two and three. It is. It has to be, right? Because it's, it's the same screenwriter from the first one. Yeah, they brought back Joseph Stefano. Yeah, and he was just like, fuck all that. <laughs> I can still tell my story just just all riffing off the first movie. Yeah. Which is fine. It works fine. It's oddly structured. It's it's Norman is calling into this like late night talk show. Are you saying you killed your mother, Ed? Oh, I've killed before. And now I'm going to have to do it again. 
He's totally calling into the uh, the, the studio from uh, Oliver Stone's talk radio. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's really exactly clearly. like that. They even do the like going around the yeah. the, 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 the mic scene at one point, like, yeah. the circular camera, just like <laughs> I've seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that sort of leads into flashbacks to him and, and his mother and. Uh, it just all feels very unnecessary. It's it's the problem that most prequels have, where it's like we don't need to see those. Yeah, uh, a lot great of, casting though. Th- Olivia that's, Hussey that's, is, yeah. the, is the mom is great, and uh, uh, Elliot from ET. Is Henry, Henry Thomas. Henry Thomas. Yeah, that's what really gets me by on this movie. It's just like it really everybody the actors all do a fantastic job, and they really I think bring a lot of life. Even John Landis. Fucking John Landis. John Landis shows up because it's directed by Mick Garris and he likes to put director cameos in. It's, um, it's almost more than a cameo, though. He's in a, it's a big fair role. amount of it. I mean, yeah. he doesn't have a lot of dialogue, but he's always there. He's always hanging out in the background yeah. behind Warren Frost. Yeah, oh, and, C- and CCH Pounder. Yeah. Like, that's, even I, that I, I like her fantastic. a lot. She's great. She's uh, one of those people that just kind of shows up in something. And yeah. Like, she elevates whatever small role she has. Absolutely. <laughs> that's something we can talk about the weird kind of setup because it starts off there... And the topic is mother killers on the late night talk show. <laughs> and so we've got a guy that killed his mother. Her last words were, you'll never amount to anything. I mean, I'm a murderer. I, I killed my own mother. Is that amounting to something or what? And then Warren Frost who's playing this doctor that specializes in matricide. He, well, he's playing the guy from the end of the first movie. Right. Which I didn't even pick up on uh, until, until I think said. listening to like the commentary or something. Oh, he does mention it, yeah. But I, it. I think even that, I didn't put it together. Not, not, you not, don't make not that precisely. connection at all. But he's the guy that is the exposition dump at the end of the first movie. Yeah, which <laughs> kind of explains a few things. Um, <laughs> but the weird thing with that setup is how it just peels off characters from that from that set pretty arbitrarily. Like, none of them really needed to be there, it seemed like. Yeah, I guess it's just the setup of yeah. mother killers and we're going to have these little bit of dialogue with this guy at the beginning, but... It's, he's not necessary at all, but... No, not really. He doesn't add a lot to it, but he's there. I guess it's there to kind of introduce Warren Frost, but even Warren Frost just stalks off in the middle of the movie anyway. Yeah, he just sort of vanishes. <laughs> well, I mean, Norman doesn't want to talk to him, so it makes sense that he's going to leave, because it's just like there's that confrontation scene where that's the where the camera goes around in circles. Yeah. Why don't you stay out of this from here on in? Are you asking me to leave? No. Ellen will make you a cup of coffee. I'll tell the audience You're going to question a psychopathic killer without professional help? Maybe he's had enough professional help. But the whole setup is that, yeah, Norman calls into this talk show and it's just like, well, I, I, I can tell you about you killing mom. Right. Just call me Ed. And <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously is a sly little nod to Ed Gein. Right. Kind of funny. Yeah, but he's calling um, from clearly this different house. He's not He's not at, uh, at Bates Motel anymore. He's... He's somewhere else in this nice kitchen. And he's, he's married. Dinner. Calls his calls his wife. I think that's part of my problem with it is like I, I just can't picture him in that scenario. It's a little weird. I can't picture him one married and having like this normal domesticated. You know, maybe this is. I mean, you're supposed to ignore two and three. So, but if you, you, if you just look at it like the first movie, and then this is twenty plus years later, yeah. like eh, a lot can happen between them, I guess. But you don't even really have to because you can look at you can look at that evolution between three and four. It's like in three he's got a girlfriend. That's true. That doesn't quite work out. But by four he's ready to have a wife. <laughs> but that and also calling into this talk show and just like spilling his guts about all this stuff. Like if he's trying to stay under the radar. Like, eh. well, I'm more comfortable with that because he's very recently found out something and he's discovered he's discovered essentially that he's going to have to kill somebody again. Oh sure. Really against his will. What did she do that she should pay for it with her life? She let herself get pregnant. But his logic for why he feels like he has to is very solid. Oh, sure. He's, he's extremely concerned that he's going to perpetuate more madness. He's, he's 100% convinced that it's genetic and what, whatever child he would have, like the bloodline has to end with him. And so the, that's a lot of the back and forth in between the, uh, the flashbacks, which I generally liked. The movie feels like a clip show, like a TV episode clip show, but it's clips of something that we haven't seen before, obviously. Yeah. But it's like it, either do a prequel or do a sequel. And it kind of like the, there's 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 not enough of the prequel stuff to be its own movie. Right. And there's not enough of the new stuff to really be its own movie. So it's yeah. kind of, there's this kind of like back and forth of like, it doesn't feel like either the the prequel or the new stuff is building to anything. Well, more, more so with him, the 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 current day stuff does because he's talking about you know his wife and possibly having to kill his wife. That's true, um, but I feel like that's where the balance kind of gets tilted the wrong way. Hmm. Because I think it really does balance it pretty well throughout. 
I mean, it's a it's a dumb excuse to have these flashbacks. <laughs> you know, it's just a framework, which yeah. is whatever. Um, but well, the I flashbacks think... really, I mean, I mean, they're they're informative to us as people that know the Psycho series. Yeah. But as far as the story in the movie, they don't really add much to what the actual story is no. of him and his wife. I feel like it's supposed to be kind of disjointed, along with like the radio breaks, and they always, you know, he's whenever they'll cut back to current day Norman from a flashback, like he's not holding the phone. So like, I don't know if he's like dropping the phone mid like flashback or whatever, but like, it feels like it's supposed to be sort of disjointed to me. Yeah. Um, and I think it really like the build up to uh, Norman uh, poisoning his mother and Chet, fucking Chet. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's an asshole. Oh, Chet. I get it. Like, fuck you, Chet. You only want to be naked around a lady when you're having sex with her. Any other time, it just ain't respectful. Good toast. Well, his name is Chet, first of all. This is step one. Yeah. <laughs> Never trust anyone named Chet. No, the only Chet I like is from Weird Science. Well, but he's an asshole, too. That's why he gets turned into a giant piece of shit. Hi, dudes! The way it leads up to the to the matricide and everything, and the way that they really draw her treatment of, of Norman and his character and his burgeoning sexuality yeah. and just how she fucks with him. It's its a little heavy and like it makes sense. It's gross. Yeah. <laughs> Get off of me. You are gonna forget once and for all about that filthy thing of yours. Um, but I mean, and she's, she's fantastic and she's like, does that switch off between loving and domineering so effortlessly. That should help you forget it. See? Look at yourself, boy. Ha! Girl. Yes, girl. Oh. Mama's little girl. Not a girl. It's, it's a little weird. I'm assuming you haven't watched the Bates Motel TV show. No. It's a, it was a little weird revisiting this movie after that because that's five seasons of building up that relationship. And it's so... I, I like the show a lot. Uh, it gets better in the later seasons. But it's so... Their relationship is so complex and so fleshed out. That rewatching this movie, it feels like a much inferior version of that relationship. Oh, sure. I can, yeah, um, I can see that. Because Olivia Hussey does kind of have two modes, basically. But again, I'm comfortable justifying that in that it's Norman's retelling. They could they could have played that up more too, like uh, almost a contrast between his telling of what happened and then also showing like what it really was. Yeah. And maybe discrepancy there, like that could yeah. have been interesting. I don't well, know. and depending on if you count two as three as can as canon on the fourth one, there's definitely like discrepancies there, like. In the fourth one, her uh, his father was stung to death by bees. Oh yeah, and they talk. There's in the second one, they talk about a whole different way that he died, or like, or he's killed by Miss, Miss, Mrs. Spools. Yeah, and like you've got, you know, there's like if you, if you're looking at it as a whole canon, there's a ton of discrepancies there. Yeah, so you can look at it that way. That's true. But I think I I, I think it really is 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 so carried by the the acting. To Henry Thomas point. is really good too. Henry Thomas is fantastic. He's no like, Freddie Highmore from the TV show. That's, that's that's all I can compare yeah. it to now after that. All right, fair enough. <laughs> CCH Pounder yeah. is like, and that whole balance there, and I think that's what really carries it along, and that's why I think the balance kind of falls off when Norman signs off from the uh, from the radio show and is about to head, uh, take his wife to, to Mother's house yeah. to kill her. It, the movie could have ended there, and I would have been satisfied. There's a chase, you know, through down, up and down in the fruit cellar, and she finally, uh, she's about to burst out of the doors of the fruit cellar, but Norman's there and comes down and catches her and about to kill her. Yeah. And she finally, actually, this is a really good speech. It's just like, don't my genetics matter? Don't I matter? I love you. Our baby will love you. Give us a chance. <laughs> no more blood, Norman. I think another problem is, like, that would be a great scene if her character was built up throughout sure. more of the movie. Yeah. And that, that whole ending feels like, wow, we've spent most of the movie on these flashbacks, so we haven't built up this relationship That's enough. a problem. So, and I think that's my problem with the whole movie, is that sort of, like, imbalance yeah. of everything. I can agree with that. I can see why There's that's There's good ideas in it. But. Yeah. And, yeah, then, then he... Uh, then he starts burning the house down and starts having visions of Mother and Chet. Chet. <laughs> um... <laughs> What's the matter, Norman? You're not a girl, are you? But finally, uh, escapes and the house is burning down and everything's cool and they leave and the movie cuts to black As on the baby's cry. Let me out of here, Norman! You hear me, boy? Let me out!
<laughs> Leading us into Psycho No, no, God. we're done. We're done. <laughs> we're done. Um, but yeah, I think I liked I liked Psycho Four a lot more than you did. Okay. I really, uh, I Norman got his empathy back, even though his you know obviously it's an insane person's logic, but it's still logical that he at any cost has to stop the bloodline yeah. in his head. You know, so See, I, that's a good story to me. Yeah, and that's that's only like. A, a little more, a little less than half of the movie. Sure. So uh, the flashback stuff. Eh. But yeah, unfortunately, uh, at that point, uh, Tony Perkins was was unhealthy and. Uh, One of his last away. movies, I think he did like three or four more movies after this, yeah. and that was kind of it. Yeah, so that's unfortunate. But that kind of, I assume, was one of the factors that that led to the end of it. Although they certainly could have done another movie without him. If we were, you know. He's passed on, but the baby's a grown up, and is the baby crazy? No, I thought you meant like a remake or something, which thank oh, God they never did. No, that wouldn't, that would be weird. That'd be a, a terrible idea. Yeah. Yeah. And just, you know, finding whatever uh, lady actor was known for having a blonde short haircut at the time. Like, that would be really stupid. And like completely miscasting Norman Bates. Yeah. 12 cabins, 12 vacancies. <laughs> oh, that'd be a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. You could probably isn't, you could get Julianne Moore though. That'd be a good idea. Let's go see Al Chambers. Who is he? Is there a deputy sheriff around here? Let me get my Walkman. She actually <laughs> is good in that movie. Well, I'm not surprised. She's good in everything. She 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 <laughs> makes that character more interesting than in the original movie. Yeah. But I think I'm not gonna I think watch they're it, subtly but... hinting hinting that she's gay too. Who's uh Who's Sam Loomis? Uh oh, Viggo Mortensen. Oh, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> better. Yeah, it's better. Way better. There's a so couple they've... minor aspects of that movie that are interesting. But some pluses and some minuses there. Mostly minuses. Uh, yeah, I could, I could not bring myself to watch that. You, you don't need to. You've no. seen the first movie. Yeah. You've seen the good version. Yeah. <laughs> Anne Hache, no, thank you. Yeah. Oh, she's bad in it. <laughs> I do think though, with that movie, the Gus Van Sant remake, because um, everybody says like, oh, it's so pointless, and it is. It's a shot-for-shot -shot remake. Yeah. I kind of feel like that was his intention, though. Yeah. Because he famously said when they were like, "Why are you remaking Psycho?" His answer was something like, "So no one else can." Where it's like almost like because he was using, you know, uh. Gus Van Sant has made these some weird little movies, some sort of experimental things like Jerry sure. or like uh, what was the school shoot Elephant, yeah. yeah. Um, but this was like right after Goodwill Hunting, so he had a little bit of clout from that, and I think he kind of used it to to make this sort of statement about like pointless sequels or pointless, huh. pointless remakes because yeah you can you can you know it's a shot for shot remake it's using the exact same script but it feels like such a different movie hmm. y you can't do the exact same movie and get the same end results like no matter how closely you try and replicate it so i i think it was like sort of sort of like experiment on the studio's dime where it was like intended to fail. Huh. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not trying to like justify Gus Van Sant because it is terrible. Uh, but I, I'm. I always. I've always wondered like, <laughs> was that his goal? It was just like, I'm going to intentionally make a terrible remake, it's kind just, of just to show like this is why you don't do this. Yeah. Too bad it sucks. Yeah, it doesn't mean I have to watch it. Vince Vince Vaughn is so bad as Norman. Ugh. <laughs> I think only birds look well stuffed because um. They're kind of passive to begin with. Wasn't Elijah Wood available? No, he would have been good. Yeah, see? Well, he would have been like like a teenager at that point, right? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, so generally speaking, uh, I this was my first time going through the, uh, the, the sequels, all three of them, and I definitely enjoyed watching all of them. Yeah, it's an interesting franchise that most people don't think of as a franchise. Um, and we didn't even really talk much about the TV show, but... No. <laughs> uh, I like the TV show quite yeah. a bit. It's, it's, it's not... Like, it takes place in modern day. It's not trying to, you know, be like a, a time... Pe like, like, it's a new updated version of that story. Okay. With them in modern times. Okay. Um, but their relationship, Vera Farmiga is great on it, and uh, Freddie Highmore... The, the fourth and fifth season, because the first few seasons, there's a lot of kind of like completely uninteresting side stories, like the B-plots. Okay. Where you're like, eh, just get back to Norman and Norma, because that's the interesting stuff. So by the time you get to like the fourth and fifth season, it's focused completely on them. And okay. they're, they're great, and it's really interesting and well fleshed out. Hmm. 
So a nice little kind of uh, jolt back into the life of the Psycho franchise. Cool. Yeah, it's it's you know obviously Psycho is a great movie, but the sequels are, are are more interesting than they're often given credit for. Yeah, watch Psycho too. <laughs> You'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Smell my drink.